Yeah, so um, my book uh, is a memoir. It's called Dear Universe, I Get It Now. Letters on the Art and Journey of Being Brave and Being Me. And it's a literally a book of letters to the universe, as in the higher power universe galaxy um, about, you know, life's lessons on braving one's own path and being authentic in this world, you know, not um, leaving anything up for chance or taking anything for granted, um, you know, pushing through and, and owning who you are and what you want to do in the world because we only get to do this thing once. Um, and it recently won a gold book award from the Nonfiction Author Association. So I'm very proud of that. I got this uh, handsome roll of stickers um, that I can put on the covers of all of the books. And, um, you know, given that this dream of mine at five was to have my own book with my name on it. And it originally in gold lettering, that was very specific as a part of my childhood dream. I got pretty close with this gold, <laughs> with this gold sticker. Um, so my 38 year old self is very proud of my five year old self and vice versa um, because we did it, we made it. Uh, so this book came out in 2020 um, and I can't believe it's already 2023. So it will, you know, it's already aging as far as books go. Um, but the message is timeless and evergreen and I'm continuing to get people who buy, who review the book on Amazon and Goodreads, who love it. Um, the universe has this beautiful little magic to it in that so many people read it and then come to me and say, this book found me at the exact right time that I needed it. And that has been one of like the most fun things about, about this book. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Living the Next Chapter. My guest has got the coolest classes in the world, so I'm feeling a little uh, not as cool with my glasses now. So I'm a little jealous, but I'm also very happy to have with me today, Alyssa. Perthume is with me today, and we are going to be talking about all kinds of things, writing, authorship, glasses, and more. Alicia, welcome, welcome to the podcast. Nice to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. It's so cool to have you here. Um. So let's talk a little bit about, first of all, I'd like to share with everyone where you are in this great big world of ours. I am in Burlington, Vermont. Okay. Okay. So my wife and I went to Vermont for our honeymoon in October and it was yeah. very expensive, but we went yeah. to, we went to Stowe, Vermont for our first night. Yep. And then we went to, when we went to get gas the next day. We said, how do we get to the top of, of the mountain? And the guy at the gas station said, follow the yellow line. And I'm like, I guess he's been asked that one too many times. <laughs> We're like, okay, just follow the yellow line. Can't be that hard, right? So um, really amazing there. We did bed and breakfast. One of them was called The Long Way In, and the driveway was like a mile. And so oh, yeah. it was really a long way in. So yeah. uh, really cool. But I love Vermont. So and there's like um there's a floating bridge that we went to, and the the bridge is on the water, and as you drive, the, you kind of get in the, the river like you're it's actually floating. Oh, that's news to me. And I've lived here almost my whole life. Right. And and then the covered bridges are gorgeous. And we went horseback riding in the countryside. Anyway. Oh, yeah. No, it's very, it's very um, romantic right. in a lot of ways. Yeah. And fall, I mean, you can't beat the fall in Vermont. The foliage and the leaves are gorgeous. And definitely where you were, um, you know, you get that, that mountain range, like just on the interstate and... I mean, you cannot not feel, I think, some sort of like presence of higher power yeah. um, when you're when you're tra traveling through the state at that time of year. And the nicest people in the world on top of everything. So we left our heart in Vermont. So it's beautiful. <laughs> Excellent. Anyway, a commercial for Vermont to start the podcast. I love it. So we're not sponsored by Vermont, but hey, <laughs> you know, if you got if you got some time, you want to go see the, the best colors in the fall. Or you love skiing, or you just love great people. Go to Vermont. Yeah. There you go. This commercial here's, brought to you here's by Vermont. Fact, here's a fact people should know, though, is that the the infamous uh, Christmas movie, The White Christmas, which is my favorite, um, there is no such a place as the inn that the movie takes place at. That really? is fictional. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I don't even know that it was shot in Vermont, in all honesty. But um, don't let that stop you from coming. So growing up for me, I remember watching Newhart and Newhart was all that the inn type thing and and all that. So that was kind of my thing when 
I was younger, I'm like, I love the idea of a of an inn and a bed and breakfast. I always thought it was pretty yeah. cool. So, I mean, yeah. we would get up and we would have breakfast with with our host family, you know, and we sitting around the table and the bus is coming. The kids are getting ready for school. You're like, this feels really cool to be in somebody's home. It was so yeah. so unique, so nice. But anyway, great place to go. Everyone go there. Um, thank you for sharing. That's amazing. So let's talk a little bit about your author journey. We're here on Living the Next Chapter, and we want to kind of go down that path. Where did all this start for you as far as your author journey? I'd like to kind of go back there. Yeah, so my author journey began when I was five. <laughs> um, and I feel like that's really cliche. I feel like a lot of people are like, oh, I fell in love with writing and I've always wanted to be a writer. Um, but unfortunately, in my case, it's not untrue. Uh, I am a cliche. Uh, I started to write in kindergarten. We were given our first black and white composition notebook to practice writing simple sentences and things. And then the top half of the pages had space to illustrate. And so I just fell in love with telling stories, um, typically about things that were real. So like, you know, my cat at the time or, um, you know, playing outside with neighbors or riding my bike. But writing was the thing that just lit me up immediately. And I knew, I just knew like this internal intuitive knowing um, at five that I wanted to grow up and I wanted to write books. Um, and it was a long and winding journey at that point um, because it was kind of cute for a while and adults in my life were like, oh, isn't that sweet? You know, she wants to be a writer. And then, you know, as college days approached, it was kind of like, well, what are you really going to do? Um, and so then the messaging kind of changed and the validation around this thing that I wanted to do wasn't really there as strongly as it had been. And so then I kind of had one foot in writing and one foot in um, psychology and mental health. And I thought that was going to be my breadwinner and writing would be on the side. Um, and eventually it was like, but I'm not going to not get a writing degree. So I went to undergrad and I got a double bachelor's, one of them being in creative writing. And then I went on to my master's program. And originally I started a master's in marriage and family therapy, because I was still committed to this idea that the, you know, social services field was going to be the breadwinner and writing would be something I did later. Um, but I made it about a year into my master's program and realized I was miserable. Um, it wasn't what I wanted to do the rest of my life. And I was letting myself down by not going, going for this thing that I've always believed was what I should be doing. So I changed master's and got a master's of fine arts in creative writing. And I thought that that would be like, that was it. That was like the kickoff to, you know, becoming the writer, the author, you know, um, but life had other plans and coming back to Vermont from college, which I did in Ohio, um, there weren't a lot of jobs here in Vermont that really directly utilized that master's of fine arts degree. Um, so I ended up a nonprofit and then mm -hmm. I finally found a job in academic publishing, like the only one that existed in the state that like paid a good wage and had benefits. And then that one got bought and we all got laid off. And then I was in law and then I was over here in tech and um, and writing was just kind of like waffling around, waiting to be given some attention this whole time as I was trying to like figure stuff out. And it wasn't until you know, 2018, I was going through, um, I was going through a divorce. I had just had a miscarriage. Um, I had a two-year-old. Um, I was back living with my parents. I mean, life was just not awesome. Mm -hmm. And the thing that, or one of the things that got me through that, that period was going back to writing, blogging and giving myself permission to, um, have the time with this beautiful passion of mine that had kind of taken this back seat the entire time. And the more that I got back into writing and blogging and um, the more I found myself again, um, and then my day job started to kind of fall apart in addition to all those other things. Mm -hmm. And so it was like the universe was handing me a giant invitation to step into what I had always known I should be doing and to go for it. And since there was nothing else to lose, yeah. I did it. And I jumped on the entrepreneurial journey. And within that same year, I started working on my first book. 
And uh, by 2020, Dear Universe, I Get It Now was out in the world. There you go. So would you say that you you are a writer in the beginning stages or were you becoming more of a writer through that whole process? How did this kind of develop for you then more as an adult looking at the writing process? I think I was always a writer. I was becoming a better writer. Better writer. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, writing was always a thing that I kind of leaned on or went back to. It was always like one of my strongest skill sets and strengths. Um, it was always something that I enjoyed. Um, but like those first stories and stuff that I wrote at five or 10 or whatever were horrible. I mean, there's no skill, no craft. Um, spelling and punctuation was terrible, all the things. Um, but writing is a practice and it, it's an art and like any practice or art, it requires consistency mm -hmm. and development and a continual learning and, and practicing. I mean, so I think, you know, I became a better, stronger writer, but I've always been one and I continue to improve. You know, the more that I write for other people, the more that I write for myself, the better my writing continues to be. Okay, so let's pick up on writing for other people. What are some of the things you've done in the past that um, that we can talk about? I know some of the things you've done where you're you kind of done as a ghostwriter and things like that. But what, what have you done for other people that have brought you joy as a writer? The biggest thing for me in working with other people on their books is actually not the book itself. <laughs> um, it's the seeing and hearing people when they're sharing their story, which will ultimately go into the book. Yeah. Um but it's kind of holding space for them and allowing them to speak their truth and honor their experience. And I'm like a person who can reflect back to them, you know, that must have been tough or, you know, you're a lot stronger than you give yourself credit for. Or isn't it interesting that, you know, those things happened, but now here you are and this, that and the other thing seem to be some sort of effect or result of what you've been through. Um, there's like a mirroring, I guess, that happens. And in that mirroring, you know, they have a whole different way of maybe seeing their experience, of seeing themselves, of being able to make peace with certain things that have happened or to understand how those really horrible things have, have also provided a number of kind of collateral blessings. Um, and to, to be a little bit more healed you know, uh, as a, as a process, as a part of the process of sharing with me the thing that they ultimately want to turn into a book. So how do you separate your writing style and who you are and your lived experiences and your lens, you're talking about your glasses, your lens on how you write? How do you correlate that with writing for someone else where you, where you don't seem to come up in the writing and you're trying to elevate the person you're writing for how do you kind of balance the two because i would think that you trying to your personal writing style would come up and shine and you're like wait that's not that's that's not my person i'm helping i'm trying to raise them yeah. up how do you balance the two so part of it i think is knowing um the process versus style so okay. the writing process regardless of the client that i'm working with I'm going to go through a very similar process with all of them. We're going to talk about what they want to achieve. We're going to talk about the material that they want to present or the story they want to, they want to share. Um, we're going to outline the material in a way that it makes sense to the reader and achieves their goals. And then we're going to, you know, we're going to draft, we're going to revise, we're going to draft, revise, draft, revise, right? So the steps that we take to bring the story from blank page to full manuscript are going to be the same steps. You know, they might vary in terms of how long they take or whatever, but they're the same steps. Stylistically is kind of where individual voice or way of expressing something is going to come into play. And so that's where we need to understand, OK, how does this person show up in the world? Okay. Are they, you know, are they somebody who is very uh, reserved and calculated and intentional with the way that they deliver material? If that's the case, then that's probably how the book should come across. If there's somebody who has a lot of levity and they make light of a lot of things and they use humor as a way to express themselves and to tell their story, then we want to make sure that that kind of punchy, irreverent um, tone and personality comes into the writing. Typically, my clients have a, a pretty strong sense of how they want their writing to come across. You know, well, I want it to be honest and vulnerable or I want it to be straightforward and matter of fact. Um, 
And they also usually have an awareness of how they're trying to reach their reader. And so if they know that their reader, for instance, is a startup founder who's got the attention span of a gnat, um, you know, they know that they don't want long chapters because they're trying to they're trying to reach their ideal reader and they know their ideal reader doesn't have a lot of time. Right. right? Um, other people might see their ideal reader as like, let's say, you know, they want to reach the person who's also had the similar experience as them, you know, uh, child abuse or divorce or grief and loss. Um, so in knowing that part about the reader, um, then we know that we might want to evoke emotion. Uh, we want to make them feel like they can see themselves in this person's story. And so now we might be using different types of um, craft principles of writing to evoke that emotion, sensory detail, dialogue, action, scene. Um, so it's really understanding um, the reader. It's understanding the motives behind the work, the goals that the author wants to accomplish, and also understanding the author themselves. How, how different is it to write for somebody else than compared to writing your own works? It's a very different lift. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, it's the difference really is like, you know, um, between having to go to the file room and look for the things that you don't know exist and not needing to get away from your desk at all because everything is filed and stored up top. Nice. Um, you know, when when you're writing for yourself, you've got your own memories, your own experiences, your own voice, like, you know, all of that. And you might need to do a little bit of digging to like, remember the year or the name of something or a particular detail. Right. But more or less, you're like 90% there because it's you, you know, you, you're well-versed in you. When you're writing for somebody else, you have to get to know them to the depths that you know yourself. Wow. And that's not something that happens by osmosis. And it's not something that happens quickly. Um, and even when you know somebody really well, when you know their story, you think, <laughs> well, um, as you actually sit down to write their book, especially in the case of memoir, um, you'll be surprised at how many things you don't know that you have to then go and ask. Um, you know, I might know that a certain scene happens where this person and that person talk inside a room, but now all of a sudden, I don't know what the other person sounds like. I don't know what they might be wearing. I don't know what gestures they might normally use. I might not know what the room looks like. Um, I might not know what my my person who I'm writing for, what they were thinking at the moment, if they were fidgeting. I mean, there's so many like minute details that now you have to go and get and source in order to make that scene or that chapter really come to life. In, in kind of straighter nonfiction, business books, leadership, um, you know, sales, uh, whatever, you know, those are a little more cut and dry because you're not trying to develop characters, right. you know, yeah. um, in the same way you're not developing scenes. But um, if you don't know that industry or you don't know that niche or, you know, you don't have the expertise that your client does, you're still having to ask a ridiculous amount of questions, go and look at the other material that they published, listen to their interviews, perhaps watch their keynotes, um, you know, scour through their blogs, um, to not only study their voice and how they're already naturally writing content out in the world, um, but also to study the content so that you appear to know what you're talking about because everybody's going to be expecting that this person knows what they're talking about because they believe that they're the one who wrote it. Right. Yeah. Okay. Because in a typical book, an author will submit it for editing and it'll come back with suggestions and there's edits that happen between the author and the editor. But you're kind of in the middle between editing and the the person you're helping to write the book for is it hard to take notes from an editing feedback and take it back to the person or are you handling it it seems like one more extra step that most authors wouldn't have to even think about yeah when you're writing for yourself i mean you're going to go to an outside opinion right a developmental editor line editor proofreader whoever it is at whatever stage and then you're going to have this kind of one-to-one -one relationship, right? Because you're the author and they're giving you the direct feedback. In a ghostwriting uh, kind of instance for me, I always try to employ a developmental editor if I can and I've got time and we've got budget for it. Um, because by the time we're ready for that, I'm so close to the project, I can't see it objectively anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and I want the objective opinion to make sure that I haven't failed in my job and also that the author doesn't feel like we failed 
you know, when they put that book out there into the world. Um, ultimately, it's a matter of um, like creative license, I guess, meaning that we can get feedback from an outside editor. If I don't agree with it or the author doesn't agree with it, we have the choice to say, thank you, but we're good on this yeah. particular point. Like okay. we're not going to. Um, but if it's something that's super valid and, and both of us see it, then it's likely something that needs to be fixed, you know, um, because if they're pointing it out and the two of us also agree, then we've got three people who are all seeing the same error yeah. or uh, thing that could be improved. That makes sense. Um, in general terms, from the moment somebody reaches out to you and asks for help in writing something and working on a project, again, there's a lot of things that could go into this answer, but what's a general time frame for you to work with somebody from initial contact to a book in their hand? Is are we talking months and months and months, a year? Like, can you give us a little time frame idea? Yeah. So, um, with one client, it was a coaching capacity. Um, so she was doing all the writing, but I was coaching from the moment that we started just planning out the book to the moment that it came out into the world, 18 months. Okay. Okay. Um, for a ghostwriting client, I like a minimum of 12, but that doesn't mean that it might not go longer, depending on the size of the manuscript, scope of the project, um, how clean was our first draft, and now what do we need to do to revise, um, and a number of other things. Life happening and throwing off the, the schedule yeah. or the timeline. Um, and certainly, if people come in, in either instance, coaching or ghostwriting, if they come in and they are very unclear on their idea, they're not really sure what they're trying to say yet, and we have to do a lot of kind of concept conceptualizing and envisioning work, then it, we could take longer to do that before we actually get started in the actual drafting, right? Because if we don't know where we're going, that draft's going to be a mess, yeah. and we're going to feel like it's just a constant uphill climb. It's fascinating to, to get a little peek behind the scenes about all of this, because when you see a book on the shelf, you just, for the most part, you naturally assume that the author wrote the book, and why would I even wonder and question? But then the other side of me is like, if I was a ghostwriter, I would be looking, going past the shelf going, that's, I, I wrote that book. You know, my name's not on the cover, but that's, that's my baby, right? I'd be like, I'd want to tell everyone that's my baby, but I yeah. can't really tell you that's my baby. So is it awkward in that sense where you have books out there that no one has any idea that you were a part of? You know, a handful of years ago when I was getting my degree, the idea of ghostwriting was appalling to me. Okay. Um, my ego was huge, uh, which I think most 20 year olds it is. Um, and I was like, no way would I write somebody else's stuff and then not get a single credit for it. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and that has shifted so much, uh, you know, um, I just feel honored to be able to do something that other people either don't have the skill or the time to do, but that is very much theirs, right? Yeah. It's their story. It's their message. It's what they want to say. I'm putting maybe words together in a beautiful way or in a way that they didn't think to do it. But ultimately I'm really just trying to speak on their behalf, but it's, it's them truthfully. And so the credit does belong to them. I got paid for the service of writing the words. Right. Um, right. And I'm, I'm good with that. Yeah. Uh, but the other thing too, is that I've had some very generous, clients. You know, um, the first person that ghost wrote a book for, she, she said in the acknowledgements and I want to thank my ghostwriter. <laughs> it's like, I was the most visible ghostwriter for that book, <laughs> like known, you know? Um, and wow. I'm working on a book right now where the client doesn't want to have their name appear by itself and have anybody think that they penned a word. And so they would like it to appear as their name and then with, and then my name. Um, and so I will now be known for working on this book by just, you know, that slight addition of wit and then, you know, my name also appearing on the cover with them. Um, others have acknowledged me, you know, in the back section of their book under acknowledgements, and maybe they've chosen to say book coach or editor or use some other word that doesn't out me as mm -hmm. their ghostwriter, but they want to acknowledge the service that I've provided, you know, along, along the journey. And, and frankly, that enough, just a thanks in the back is, beautiful and wonderful um it's the experience that i hold on to what i learn about myself and about people and about writing in the process of being the ghost or the coach um that really serves me the most so how directly has 
the lessons you've learned as a ghostwriter impacted your personal writing? Um, I feel like I write cleaner and more efficiently in my own writing yeah. because I'm such a constant flow of writing for everybody else. Um, but at the same time, the actually sitting down to do the writing is the hardest for me now. Mm -hmm. uh, it's self-discipline because I am so tapped out um, energetically in, in writing for everyone else that it's it's very difficult to prioritize my own writing um, at the end of the day after spending hours, you know, working on other people's books. So I'm figuring that part out right now. It's an interesting balance, right? Because it's like, I, I I'm assuming in a sense, as an outside perspective, that writing for yourself is more for is more relaxing and more something you do for yourself. And then everything you do for everyone else seems more like a job in a sense. Is that kind of yep. how it feels a little bit like that? That is very true. The problem here is that I have an extreme accomplishment identity, uh, overachievement identity that I'm always battling. Um, and maybe I need to go like to one of those like uh, neuro linguistic programming people and have them do some head work. Um, but I often prioritize everybody else, regardless if it's work or not, ahead of my own writing, seeing it as more necessity than my own creativity because it pays the bills and it keeps the lights on and, and it's my livelihood. Um, so the focus and the emphasis and the priority goes there. And then it's like, if I've got anything left, maybe I'll sit down and write a few words. Um, but likely it's like, I'm done with the screen. I'm done with the keyboard. Yeah. And I'm like, I need to go for a walk. Yeah. Like I need yeah. to unplug and not be, you know. And so actually one of the creative solutions I had for this was I asked for a typewriter for my birthday. With the whole so clean, that, tick, tick, clean, yes, everything. Ding. Yes, exactly. I asked for a typewriter birthday because I thought well maybe like the more uh like tactile um like the sound the motion the not having a screen and actually having like a physical piece of paper um might inspire a different wave of energy and creativity that was different than sitting down to another laptop or desktop computer and facing a, a bright shiny screen and yeah. You know, um, so yeah, so I got I got a typewriter at the beginning of this month for my birthday, and now I'm figuring out how to use it because it's actually not at all intuitive. It is very complicated. <laughs> it doesn't underline misspelled words. You can swear at it now because you make a mistake. You're like, oh, that is great. There's no. There are buttons and levers and um, things <laughs> that I'm like I don't even. I literally I took a bath last night and read the manual. Like, because I was trying to figure out how I was going to use this efficiently. I'm very excited, but it's a bit of a process. <laughs> I love it too. And the, the two keys get tied up together and they both hit the paper they get at the same time. You get this weird new letter that you've created. You're like, oh, that's nice. What is that? Um, <laughs> cool. <laughs> uh, okay. So let's talk about what you have written yourself. You said before we hit record that you kind of won some small award for your book which sounds amazing i'm saying small in a joking way but tell you about the, your book and the award what's going on here yeah so um my book uh is a memoir it's called dear universe i get it now letters on the art and journey of being brave and being me and it's a literally a book of letters to the universe as in the higher power universe galaxy um about you know life's lessons on braving one's own path and being authentic in this world you know not um leaving anything up for chance or taking anything for granted um you know pushing through and and owning who you are and what you want to do in the world because we only get to do this thing once um and it recently won a gold book award from the nonfiction author association so i'm very proud of that i got this a handsome roll of stickers nice. um, that I can put on the covers of all of the books. And, um, you know, given that this dream of mine at five was to have my own book with my name on it. And it originally in gold lettering, that was very specific as a part of my childhood dream. I got pretty close gold sticker. With, with this gold, <laughs> with this gold sticker. Um, so my 38 year old self is very proud of my five year old self and vice versa um, because we did it. We made it. Mm. When did that book come out? Uh, so this book came out in 2020. Um, and 
I can't believe it's already 2023. So it will, you know, it's already aging as far as books go. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the message is timeless and evergreen. And I'm continuing to get people who buy, who review the book on Amazon and Goodreads, who love it. Um, the universe has this beautiful little magic to it in that so many people read it and then come to me and say, this book found me at the exact right time that I needed it. And that has been one of like the most fun things about, about this book. When a book finds you. I love that. That's really nice. Um, yeah. Tell me about some of the reviews you've heard back. What, what, what else are people saying about the book? Um, people find it to be something that both makes them laugh and cry. <laughs> um, somebody uh, compared it to snuggling up on the couch and, and eating a warm cookie, uh, which was kind of fun. Nice. And nice. I've had people take pictures of it, um, like poolside <laughs> with them. Somebody even took a picture of it once wearing sunglasses and had a towel wrapped around it, which was hilarious. Um, and I've had a lot of people who have related to uh, either the childhood wonder and imagination that kind of gets lost along the way. Other people have really related to the overachievement chapter and how much we tend to focus on doing and accomplishment and um, external validation more than how we show up and intrinsic value and those types of things. Um, so it's been it's been really interesting which chapters or things that people have hung on to. But what I love about it is that it's hit people from all places, all ages, all races, all orientations. Yes. Um, and that makes me so incredibly happy because while I didn't specifically mean to write a book that would necessarily speak to all people, um, you know, it really has in some in some way. And I think that's a really incredible result. So we have listeners that have joined us because you're on the show when that's amazing because they're they have the book. They have it wrapped in a towel with sunglasses, as you say. Um, they're here to to hear you on the podcast. Um, I would love to give you the opportunity to talk to them directly. I'm moving out of the way. What would you like to say to your readers who have supported you and purchased the book and shared the book with others? What would you like to say to them? I could not have done any of this without knowing that there was at least one person on the other side needing this book. But the fact that I now know that so many of you need this book fills me up to the brim. Um, writing this book, I was so fearful that no one would get it. No one would appreciate it, that I was out of my mind for trying to say the things that I wanted to say, that I wasn't old enough or experienced enough or whatever enough. Um, to write this book. And I never even considered how many people might love it, how many people might rally around me. And whether I have known you or you're a complete stranger, your love, your loyalty, your fanship has all meant the absolute world. And you really have made a little girl's dream come true. And the next book for sure is for all of you, because I know how much you loved this first one. Nice. And for an author that's struggling with the same deep thoughts that you were in creating this book, what would you say to them as they kind of struggle their way through and try to get their words on paper? So my favorite thing to say to people who are trying to do this now that I've been through it is stop thinking about pleasing the masses mm -hmm. because the masses are just a crowd of faceless folks that don't matter. Focus on one person that you would like to reach that you know your book needs to get to right. focus on them the whole time. And I guarantee that if you can focus on the one and you can write for the one and the one person is impacted, then there will be more, but don't think about everyone at first. Just think about that one person who really needs your book. And that will set into motion the ripple effect that you're looking for. I love it. Okay. So I have a question for you that I've never asked. I have 190, yeah. 190 episodes. 190 authors have come through. I've never thought I'd ask this question before. But based on the answers you're giving and the path you're taking us on, I feel like I could lob this to you and I'm I'm probably going to get a really interesting answer. So no pressure, but here we go. Um, in podcasting right now, in content creation, everyone is flipping out about AI. AI, oh, this, I'm so AI tools, this, this, and this. And we will give them all credit for all. There's so many. There's new ones every day. Every five minutes, there's another one. So 
everyone is like, I'm just going to use these tools and they're going to help me write my story or create my podcast or do my Instagram. They're going to do all this thing for me. I'm just going to push a button and see what happens from your perspective. How do, are, are you embracing AI? Does it help you? What are your thoughts as you kind of see the world reacting in such a way to all the AI tools that are out there right now? So two words that you said are really operative, tools and helpful. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Tools and helpful. So my position is really, you know, AI, it's, it's neutral. It's yeah. about the person using it and how they're using it and their motives for using it and the ways that you're using it that then make it, you know, quote, unquote, good or bad, right? Effective or not effective, um, ethical or not ethical, full of integrity or not full of integrity, mm -hmm. right? Um, we are behind the machine. You know, we had this debate probably when computers and the internet came around and now we're having it again with AI. We are in control. We are the ones pushing the buttons and whatever. So we're bringing our own motives and our own expectations into the use of these things. Can they be helpful? Yes. Um, I have a client who uses like chat GPT to, um, kind of do the first scrub of getting some ideas generated for a blog post, right? Um, but then that's where it stops. Like it's almost more like a brainstorming tool in that instance. I have another client who uses some AI tools to help um, visualize settings that they're writing about in their fiction novel. Um, and then that inspires new ideas that they didn't otherwise have because they could see a visual of what they already knew. Um, so there's, I mean, somebody was telling me about an AI tool that helps with business SOPs. And I'm like, yeah, because I don't want to do that. I don't want to sit there and write my own SOPs. Yeah, so yeah. yeah, I would use a tool for that kind of efficiency. Um, but again, tools, and they're being used to assist or help, assist, not do, not right. perform 100%, or at yeah. least that's my take, that they shouldn't be used 100%. Like, when have we ever been able to push a button or have this one size fits all approach to anything and then successful. Like we never have. Um, I don't think AI is really going to change that. I think AI, if we all just start pushing the button blindly um, is going to make a mess of things because we're not using it correctly, right. but also right. it's just going to make everything be really generic yeah. um, because it's just spitting out information based on what it's curating or whatever that's already out there and exists. Um, and so especially when it comes to writing a book, my biggest pet peeve is when I hear people say, I wrote a book with ChatGPT. And I really have a problem with this because writing is an action which requires your involvement. When you put in a prompt for a book into ChatGPT, you're not writing it, you're prompting it. You are prompting a book out of ChatGPT. Nice. You're not writing a book with ChatGPT. Right. Um, and I don't think, I haven't tested it, but I don't think ChatGPT is working as like, okay, chat, you put in one sentence of the story and then I'll put in the next. And so now we're collaborating on a book, you know? Um, so this idea of like somebody sitting at home generating a 40,000 word story or book with an AI program and them saying that they've written it. No, you're probably sitting there with your heels up waiting for the thing to generate all 40,000 words. Um, now, if you've then taken that and you've worked on it, then you've, rev you've revised it or you've edited it, but you still haven't written it. Uh, and then you need to understand like, is it really that great of a book or is it very gener generic and very vanilla mm -hmm. because this artificial intelligence has created this thing. Artificial intelligence cannot replace authenticity and your intelligence. Mm -hmm. So if you wanna be known, you want your work to be great, do the work. So, Mic drop. You no, know, I love it. So <laughs> I'm a musician, and my my response would be, a good song can be played around the campfire on an acoustic guitar, um, and still have quality, without all the fluff and all the extras, right down to its basics. And it's been performed by the person who wrote it, or right, it can be stripped down and and performed in a really simple way. And when you come to your book and come to writing, even if you use these tools to help you. It's got to come back down to the author at the end of the day, sitting around the campfire, telling the story where the true 
authorship of whatever you've created will be on full display and you can't hide behind any of these tools. Your typewriter is not connected to the internet and AI can't help you. So you have to know how to yeah. write, right? Yeah. So I just, I, again, I, I, I've never asked that question to anyone and I'm so happy I asked you because that's what I was hoping to hear from you. And I love the authenticity side of that. And I'm just, I'm a little nervous that in a world of everyone trying to do the microwave attempts of being creative, push a button and then I can just go and watch TV. Um, I just feel like we're, we're going to water down our message over time if we rely on these tools too much. So I like your Well, it's not even creativity, really, when you, right. you think about it. If you're just hitting a button, that's not creativity. Right. That's instant gratification. Creativity is always about process. It's about getting your hands dirty. It's about exploring, you know, whether that's music or paint or clay or words, you know, whatever medium you're playing in, you're playing. It's imagination. It's action. It's activity. It's mind and body connection through whatever expression or form, right? So if you're just hitting a button and you're walking away to go binge watch something on Netflix, like you're not being creative and you're, and you're not an artist if that's what people are going for. Like, you know, like anything done well, you've got to work for it. Like, you know, it doesn't mean that the work has to be hard or unpleasing or unentertaining, but you, you need to be the one that's present and available for that. Um, and I think, you know, to some extent, I wonder, I don't have any data, but I wonder, you know, are people like, oh, well, with the wave of self-publishing and now all these AI tools, I can like maybe make a buck, like just pumping out all of these manuscripts and going this self-publishing option and like be rich, like all the people that I see in the sponsored ads all over the social media, you know, and I'm thinking what people don't realize is that those people who are doing really well for themselves based off of self-published books on Amazon, you know, they're not just cranking out useless material and then like letting it sit there and it's just generating big sales for them. There is a process there too. And there's action and intention and a strategy and probably their stuff isn't complete loads of crap. Um, you know, anybody who thinks that they're just automatically going to make a ton of money off a book, like they're reaching for that like 1%. That's not a majority of the rest of us who have right. published books. And that's also not usually how you make money off of your book. So if that's the motivation, then they need to understand more about the publishing industry and how it actually works and how you make money off your book. Because it's not just like you hit print, you upload it somewhere, and then, you know, the book fairies come and, you know, send you a bunch of money. Gold stickers fall from the heavens. Yeah. yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. So in, in a world where everything's going more vanilla, then when people are using tools, maybe in the wrong way, I heard somebody say you can use AI tools as an assistant, but never as an employee. And I'm like, that's mm. good. I like that. So like that, but people yeah. are starting to use them as employees. The one thing I think that makes people stand out then is an authentic story that's told from your point of view as the writer as the creator Absolutely. because you lived it so you talking yeah. about yourself at five and your, ori your orientation story of how you got to where you are today can't be duplicated by any kind of ai tool because it's your story Absolutely. so lean heavily into your story and just by doing that you're going to be more unique than a large mass of other authors and creators because they're using tools without really understanding the impact of it yeah, I mean, quite frankly, there's actually a massive opportunity right now for the people who are not going that direction, right? right? The, type, the people with typewriters, yeah. I mean, the more vanilla everybody becomes by just relying on these tools to speak for them, the more that the people who aren't are going to rise above because they're not going to sound like the drones, you know, flying overhead. There it is. That's exactly what I was hoping I was going to get from you today, and I'm so happy that you jumped on that and i could tell there's a little bit of fire there and there that's what i love there. i love <laughs> all right that's great okay so again where's the book available where do we go and give us a little hint what's coming next i'd like to know that too yeah so just to answer your first question so dear universe i get it now can be available on barnes and noble amazon um you can buy it direct from me you can also find it on bookshop.org if people want to support their indie and local bookstores bookshop.org is great 
um, because then you can go and get it from kind of a smaller fish who definitely needs your purchase to stay afloat. So um, I would definitely promote bookshop.org over the giants. Um, so you can find it in all those places. And what's next? So, um, well, there's a couple of things. So one, I'm uh, collaborating and co-authoring a book with a colleague of mine, um, the title of which we are still finalizing. Um, but that will be out early 2024. And it is for the aspiring independent author who doesn't know a thing about writing, publishing, and making money off of their book. Good. If it, this book is for you. No. Yes. Um, so, uh, so I'm excited about that. That is going to be mammoth. It's huge. We went way beyond what we thought because we just could not help ourselves. Um, but we're hoping it's going to be this like beautiful desk reference, like the thing that everybody's going to have within arm's reach, sitting right next to them Good. to go. It's packed with information, tons of appendices, um, checklists, templates, exercises. I mean, just the whole, the whole kit and caboodle, um, trying to give everything we've got to make it kind of a one-stop shop kind of book, um, for that kind of author. Um, apart from that, you know, I started a second memoir last year. I've had to put it on pause. The timing wasn't quite right. I'm really looking forward to getting back to that once this manuscript, this other one I was just mentioning, is kind of um, off my desk. And that is a second memoir, um, loosely titled right now, uh, When I Die, and um, tracks a special relationship that I had um, with a woman that's actually a character in Dear Universe. So um, it's kind of, it's picking up on kind of one story thread and really focusing on this relationship and her death and, um, my role in her crossing over. Wow. Okay. So please come back when the next ones are ready. I'd love to have you back and just talk more. <laughs> right. Um, and I want to get an update on the typewriter because I think that's cool. Uh, that's so awesome. Um, thank you for being <laughs> on the podcast. I'd I love laughing with you and hearing your insights and um, very inspirational for, for the audience as well to be part of this. So thank you for thank making you so time for to be part of this. It's great. Thank you for the invite. And I will definitely come back. Okay. All right. I'll hold you to I will hold you to that. Uh, everyone, please go check out all the show notes and everything and uh, you'll find links. And I love bookshop.org. Great suggestion. Everyone, please head over there. Support these local... Uh, mom and pop shops and these little places that really could use your support. That's great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for being part of living the next chapter. Hey, look at we're We're having such a great time talking to authors around the world. If you are an author and you would like to be on this very show, I would love to talk to you livingthenextchapter.com 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 is the best way to get in touch with us. There you'll find our social media and blah 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 la di da and such. You author soon to be author new author currently writing your book author published author we need you here the seat's empty, microphone set up, we're waiting for you, livingthenextchapter.com. We would love to have you on the podcast. Yeah, I am talking, I'm talking to you. Yeah, you should be here. See you at livingthenextchapter.com.